Okay. How do you how do you follow up from such inspiring stories? Two of them. I'm humbled. I'm inspired, um, and I feel my story, your stories, tower in front of mine. So, everyone, take a breather. Just hear my story. Relax. <laughs> First of all, namaste to everyone here and everyone online. Um, my name is Himanshu. And growing up, games were an anchor for me. You know, see, I had a, a very nomadic lifestyle. As, I, as soon as I turned three months old, my family moved from India to Iraq. I turned three years old, we moved again to a little place called Bahrain. I don't think many people will know Bahrain. It's a small island country um, in the Middle East, just about 1 16th the size of Sydney. It's, uh, it's that big. Anyways, I was there for about 10 years, moved back to India. But within all of this, games were the constant for me. You know, I could, I could log in to these virtual worlds irrespective of my physical location and be instantly among a familiar place again. I instantly got obsessed with games around adventuring, you know, going on quests, trying to solve problems, trying to, you know, solve puzzles. And little did I know at the time, these learnings, unlearnings, problem solving, adapting, all of these skills were very soon going to help me. And in fact, they had already started to help me when I moved from the Middle East to India. Now, I think it's very, it's hard to imagine these days because of the internet. The internet is everywhere, so we've got a shared cultural layer among different countries. So we have a common language, at least some of it. But back in the 90s, Middle East and India were very, very different places. And top that up with a skinny teenager moving countries and trying to adapt. So it's really crazy. But games really helped me with that and trying to adapt to those areas. And I feel I'm, I'm very lucky in the sense that I've got very supportive parents. Because when I announced to them that I will be pursuing a career in games, <laughs> they didn't, yeah, they, they backed me up fully. They didn't flinch. Um, but you've got to understand, this is early 2000s. The games industry is not what it is right now. You, I'm sure most of you have seen eSports or something around those lines. It's a multi-billion dollar beast right now. But at that time, it was primarily North America focused. Very little in Asia, very little even in here in Australia and New Zealand. So I don't think I was doing the best of things, and I will be tested. I didn't know that at the time. So I said, all right, let's go for it. Let's uh, try this career. So I start searching, and obviously, I find nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I apply everywhere. I go for it. Um, so I said, OK. Let's try to get into the software industry. That's a subset. So I do get in. And also, to preface that, this is the time when the notorious word outsourcing was very popular in India. A lot of people in the West would know outsourcing. Uh, but for someone who had a computer science degree, it was an easy way to land a cushy job. But I had a creative itch to scratch, so I tried to find a games career. Anyways, didn't find one. Finally, after a couple of, you know, a couple of months of applying, I finally find one job. I think it was probably the only one in all of North India at the time of an Xbox programmer. <laughs> so I apply for that, get the job, start working on it, loving it, and the project gets pulled away. Classic case of sales teams over-promising on deliverable timelines. <laughs> and you will start to see a pattern here. So I go, okay, now I'm back to square one again. 
try something else. Find the first game studio in India, apply for it, get into it, move cities to the Bollywood capital of India, Mumbai. Uh, I didn't know at the time, but the studio was run by a Bollywood mo movie producer's son. And so I go there, I'm really happy, we're going to do a lot of cool stuff, we're going to do a lot of work. Uh, one small problem, there's a culture in Bollywood of working people to the bone. So I was casually working 12 to 15 hour days over there. But at least I was working on some projects I loved. It's all right. Moved into that work style, adapted. Because of the work I did there, I got picked up by EA Singapore. I was like, okay, now I'm sorted. I'm finally in a place I wanted to be. I'm making an impact. I'm making games that are touching millions of people, doing all of that. One year into that role, studio closes. <laughs> and I'm starting to see a pattern here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, is it me? I don't know. <laughs> so studio closures is a pretty big deal. Uh, the games industry is pretty insular, it's very hard to get in, and then once you get in, every, almost everyone knows you. So the studio closes down, a lot of people reach out, I get an opportunity in Hong Kong. I said, okay, let's go there. Oh, you gotta go back to India to sort your paperwork, but we want you to start working. I do that, uh, as luck would have it, and as you can predict, labor laws changed, which means startups now have to have at least two years of runtime before getting an expat in. So again, I don't want to go again and again. This is a complete pattern that kept going on. In my time in the games industry, very, it's been very rewarding. It's a very, um, it's a fantastic industry, lots of impact. But I've seen no less than seven or eight company restructures, changes, teams dissolving. And I've seen, I've seen two studio complete shutdowns. And it's not always been as bad. I mean, you know what they say, you can't connect the dots looking forward. But because of me moving back, I started hanging out with some of my Delhi friends. And through that, I got a chance introduction to my now wife. So, so some good came out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, my journey into Laureate is also um, because of something like that. We were uh, in a city, now fast forward, I'm happily married for a couple of years. We were in a city where we don't see our futures. So we moved to the corner of, wor of the world, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, lovely studio, really multicultural, absolutely fantastic. As you can predict, 10 months in, studio shuts down. <laughs> uh, I, I think this is not because of me, because of an investor buyout. Vivendi bought out Gameloft in a, in a worldwide deal. Uh, and they, the new strategy was to exit out of New Zealand. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. And that's the time when Media Design School had a chat with me. And I'm going, mm, do I want to get into education? When the games industry speed is really, really fast. We churn out updates every two, two weeks. You can do something, you can see the player's reaction, you get good or bad comments, you can see play, people playing video games. So I was a bit worried, but there was one point in me that I thought, you know, maybe there's some possibility. Because back in the day, uh, a couple of years ago, I was working on a Facebook game. Completely non-glamorous, no gamer wants to work on Facebook games. It's most boring. But when I joined the team, a couple of days in, I'd, I'd see these, these mountains of mail on, on the side. And I go like, what's happening? One day I asked my producer, I was like, what? What is that? And please note, we were working on a game, the whole premise of which is you've got to dress little kitties. That's the whole game. And I go, that's not, uh, but, but it's okay, I, I'm learning. <laughs> turns out, turns out, all of that mail was from hospitals across, across the US. There were students, or there were, there were terminal Ill, Ill kids playing these games, because Facebook runs on almost every platform. You don't need hardcore graphics. These kids were finding solace and just dressing these. They were getting to escape those pains. And I'm like, you know what? The games industry doesn't really think about, they're just very entertaining. But there's a real value in games in that medium. 
So anyways, I said, okay, let's go for it. And boy, was I wrong about the pace of Laureate. <laughs> Uh, I am happy about it. It's it's really fast. We get to do a lot of stuff from, uh, you know, from taking the games across the Tasman, to even working on the creative tech stuff, to even positive leadership. Um, so the journey has been um, a lot of fun. But for me, uh, the thing that I if, I if I have to leave one message, for me it's about adaptability. I realize my story is not unique, right? But it's not common yet. From my tech background and from my um, views on um, creative technology, I can clearly see these things changing very quickly. Parents will not be asking their kids, you know, what's the, what's the, what do you want to be when you grow up? They'll probably be asking, what's the five things you want to be when you grow up? I'm pretty sure a lot of you had to adapt your careers and shift, and that's where I see in my you know, adapting into my new role, looking at our ways of learning, unlearning, and lifelong learning, and how, you know, something around micro-learning can help define these journeys. Thank you.